All right, folks, welcome back to Heavy Hands. Um, another episode of Heavy Hands, that is. We are very close to the holidays. We're very close to the end of the year. And we are out of UFC events, at the very least, until, I believe, January 15th. I'm your host, Connor Rebush. With me, as always, is Phil McKenzie. And uh, we're going to look back at 2021's last fight card before we move into what some of you may still think of as uh, Christmas or the holiday season. Um, those of you, of course, who have not already just started calling it Handy's time in your head. Because I know that's what I spend all year looking forward to, Phil, don't you? Uh, they are the gift that everyone wants, I think. Yeah. Everyone wants a handy. Mm-hmm. Don't re-gift a handy. That's important. Uh, different from other gifts in that respect. But they are great. Everybody uh, wants Very them. personal, <laughs> I think. Yeah. The ones particularly. Yeah. Uh, it sort of brings, this, this, this angle sort of brings new meaning to the term worst brain thinking. Oh, it really does. <laughs> I knew that was the reason why that was my favorite award. <laughs> so, uh, on that note, by the way, before we jump into our card for this, this last card of the year, which was Lewis versus Dowkhouse, um, quite strong, honestly. Um, it was, it was unusually like not, dog shit at least for the the main card uh, on paper I and mean, it was uh, i think mainly it was just absurdly violent yeah and yeah and in in uh in effect it was just a really violent card there were a shitload of finishes including fights like pennington chasen which you would really have thought going in like there's going to be some stinkers raquel pennington often has trouble getting out of second gear macy chasen doesn't really seem to quite know what she's doing nope you in fact got a firefight followed by a finish uh in that one so Kind of hard to complain about how things played out, uh, even if the lineup was, you know, interesting, but, but a little too odd to be called stacked coming in. Um, odd and also often kind of old. Old. Yeah. Old is definitely another thing you would think of from this card. Uh, before that, do we, what, what sort of uh, audience participation is there in the handies field? Do we need, do we want people to send us awards ideas in addition to nominees for said awards we haven't published a list of what the awards are but surely there are listeners who can remember some of the more prominent categories i don't know how to do this sure whatever yeah so (laughs) nothing pops in nothing pops into your head send in your insane scattershot ideas on twitter uh, if possible, that'll be the best place to just f- collate and find them all. Use a hashtag, which I'm coming up with right now, uh, hashtag Handies2021. H-A-N-D-I-E-S 2021. And uh, send in nominees, new award category ideas, um, whatever. Just throw it at us, and I will read it in the bathroom. When my least favorite uncle comes over. Um, all right. Phil? Let's talk about Derek Lewis and Chris Dowkhouse. Should have stayed a cop. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my whole analysis. No, we picked, uh, did you pick Dowkhouse or just me? It was just you. Yeah. And I picked him. I think my stated reason was because I hated myself. Um, mm, yeah. But uh, really, it was on the basis of the idea that he would pressure and Derek Lewis would necessarily put his back against the cage. That didn't happen, so he didn't win. That's kind of my take. Yeah. I mean, like, I think, you know, Lewis is one of those people where as a, uh, if you have, like, three or four, you know, the more things you have from, like, a collection of of, like, killer techniques against this person, the more likely you are to win. With, you know, being Derek Lewis and there being, like, a single wild card chance that you're just going to die. Like, if, they're, if they've got a big jab, real like a consistent low kicking or even just kicking game, mm-hmm. uh, and, like, consistent pressure, all these kind of things um, are are really useful. I think, yeah, Rockhouse's path to victory was more just that, like, he could come out there and just 
take advantage of Lewis being incredibly foot slow and just wipe him out immediately. Yeah. That's the thing, like, why I think it's a, it's just is a totally valid pick to take someone like Dow Cows because as we've seen and, you know, honestly, the rest of this card, um, sometimes people just get old and, you know, there's a, Derek Lewis finds an incredible, rides an incredibly thin line yeah. between looking like shit until he wins and then, but then, or then just like, can very, very easily slide into just looking like shit and just being finished. Yeah. Like, well, I think the a, error that uh, Chris Dalkas made was, uh, I think he came into this fight thinking that he's like, now he's a professional MMA fighter. And he has to like do smart professional MMA fighter strategy, strategy things. Cause I think, you know, typically he comes in really, really aggressive. And I think he came into this fight thinking, I mean, A, he was probably thinking, Oh, this guy punches hard. Uh, unfortunately we didn't see enough of the fight for him to start, um, wrestling based on that feeling, which is what really is the greatest piece of heavyweight strategy that usually in- ensures a loss to Derek Lewis. But I think he was also thinking, don't do too much too soon. You know, it's a five-round fight, and that's just not the right way to think as a heavyweight. You're going to get tired in four minutes anyway. Like, the moment anything happens, your energy bar is going to start draining. Derek Lewis understands that. He's just quick bursts and then nothing. Like, that's how you preserve. <laughs> but he, t- I, he Derek took full advantage of Dalkaus being unusually, um, you know, passive. Dalkaus looked like he came in and wanted to do like a Stipe versus Verdum kind of approach. And uh, I don't think he really has the, the craft necessary to pull that off. And Derek Lewis was just perfectly happy and able to just run up to him and punch him. It's pretty much that simple in my book, right? He just let mm-hmm. Derek Lewis cut off yeah. the cage and hit him first. Yeah. It was like, the, here's a person who's, yeah, who, whose main problem is that he's defensively horrible. Yeah. And, uh, but actually, like, quite unpredictable and dangerous. And you're just like, I'm just going to give this guy time and space. Yeah. And I'm also not very good defensively, defensively and I'm going to take a defensive approach. Uh, which would seem to be sort of out of character. Uh, also, small cage. That may be a point that, uh, you know, bears mentioning with a, a few of these results. Yeah, I, I really felt like it was, was actually, that was one thing that, that kept popping into my, my head. Like, how the cage looks small today. Like, yeah. there were just seemed to be a lot of fights where it was, was, it seemed to be a factor. Mm hmm. Uh, well, on that note, are we done? Should we move on to the co-main event? Because that was certainly a. Small... I do want to say mm-hmm. I, I really liked, uh, Eric Lewis just being incredibly sour about how lame five rounds are. Yeah, the entire that was time awesome. After the that was good. I think my the part the the part that actually made me hoot in laughter was when he he went. It was. And uh, Bisping started to pull the mic away from him as he was talking. He was going like, like, get my next fight. That's going to be three rounds, five rounds. All of that. It was just like, <laughs> it, just, it was it fading away <laughs> as the mic was pulled away. It was just like this mumbling. Fuck all that. Yeah, Derek has an incredible sort of um, stage presence where he's just not charismatic. That's his charisma. <laughs> <laughs> like mm-hmm. he's he's like a fucking mumble mouth um who like doesn't like look you in the eye <laughs> it's just kind of in his own head the whole time but it's wonderful it's it's very charming in sort of a roundabout way uh, yeah it was really good like, do you want a title fight yes if they can make it yeah it was really the best response anyone's given because bisping loves pushing for the call outs um, yeah. like it almost feels now that that is in fact a top down thing where the commentators are instructed to demand call outs from the fighters. 
uh, for promotional purposes. And, uh, and it was the best response. Cause usually people, it's, it's either you, you do call someone out, you came in prepared, or you're like, I'll fight whoever they want. Or maybe you throw like a ranking out there, uh, which is yep. somehow the least inspired of those three. And Derek Lewis is like, not really, cause they're long. <laughs> when asked if he wanted a title shot in, uh, in a world where it could be short, that would be great. Also, bravo, Derek. It is, it is like surprise. Like, shouldn't be funny, but it is that there are all the like the lighter weight class fighters who are generally skilled and motivated, and they're just like. All these contenders just who would just be crying out for five round fights. Yeah. And, and yet Derek Lewis is just going to get more of them. <laughs> he doesn't want them at all. That's true. He's not gonna stop getting them. <laughs> his next his next fight is a hundred percent gonna be a, um the main event of a fight card You're of a fight night card. Absolutely correct. Poor Derek. That's <laughs> 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 like me. <laughs> Almost makes me feel bad for him. Um, all right. Well, let's, um, let's talk about the co-main event then. We, we have a choice between taking a break here 11 and a half minutes in or just getting into it. I say we get into it and if it's a long first segment and a short second, who cares? Um, it's the end of the year, folks. You know, the handies are next. You know, this is, we're just, <laughs> we're just treading water <laughs> to get <laughs> to the really important episode. Um, you know, I take that back. I can never tread water when talking about Bilal. Remember the name Muhammad Phil? And, um, you know what? I feel like I was inspired by the spirit that, uh, Schwan Humes brought to our show the week before. No, you were. I told you to be. Yeah. It's just like, uh, <laughs> you, uh, well, it was actually my idea. It was my inspiration. It came from within. Um, you know, in the sense that you, Phil, are sort of a figment. You were dilly-dallying, and I said, what would Chuan do? <laughs> if I recall correctly. <laughs> I don't know. If only there were audio footage to prove your version of events. As I remember it, I felt a sort of camaraderie with Chuan, as I always have, and uh, mm-hmm. bravely made the decision to just pull the trigger and pick Bilal Muhammad, whom, you know, a million times I've said that uh, I've I've – talked about game plans that can win fights and all that and then just been like ah, i don't trust this person physically um i feel like this was the right moment you know not by any design of my own it was a complete accident that the pick i made worked out but um i feel like we are seeing steven thompson get old and also Bilal muhammad is an excellent game planner who adapts really well to different opponents huh And small yeah, cage. No, this was a this was a this was a really good pick, um, and yeah, I think there are, there are a few things that were helping, like yeah, small cage, and yeah, Stephen Thompson looking is starting to look old. No one could have seen this being just a absolute drubbing, right? Domination? No. Yeah. And it, it really led me to th- think that, like, maybe, maybe, like, I was just wrong. Maybe, like, even Thompson is not actually a particularly terrible, like, because normally, like, aging fighters still look okay against good style matchups. This didn't look like a good style matchup at all. No. And admittedly, you know, the the nature of it was that, you know, Hamid was trying to put. Uh, Thompson in sort of checkmate grappling situations as quickly and early as possible the whole time. Mm-hmm. Like, so it always would have a kind of, uh, strong momentum shift associated with it. It was, it would always look like dominant if it worked kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But even so, man, I was just like, how much better did he do than Gilbert Burns? Like a lot. Yeah. No, he, he, his, I mean, I think this, this has to be the best, just pure wrestling performance of Muhammad's career. Huh? Um, like in addition to, yeah, Thompson looking a bit slower to react to everything. And, um, 
also definitely looking to not be enjoying the small cage. These are just technically, I think, the best looking takedowns I've seen from Bilal Muhammad. He just like, yeah, the man looked like he's practiced his wrestling is what I'm saying on a technical level. Um, his chains were really, really tight. I've never seen his, uh, his double leg look that strong and just like the inexorable way yeah. that he would sort of get into position, work to a lift. He also fought, he wrestled with a kind of determination that this is a matchup where, it, I mean, I guess this is the way he strikes and this is, this is the perfect way for him to wrestle, but like it doesn't matter if it's the perfect takedown. He wasn't overly picky. It was more about what kind of fight am I having? And so, you know, like the very first takedown he hit on Stephen Thompson was like a weird lift and, and Thompson beat it. And it was like an ugly scramble and Bilal got up looking like he was drunk, you know, like swirling around like he didn't know where he was and he was worried because Stephen, any moment he was on the feet, Wonder Boy was about to crack him. Um, and it didn't matter. He went for that takedown. It didn't work. They got back up. As long as you're forcing a kind of fight where lots of takedowns are being attempted, you're doing the right thing. And, uh, yeah. Technical progression and excellent game planning. Also, um, on the note of the small cage, I feel like this was the most modern we have seen Bilal's grappling look. Like, huh. getting into a lot of what I still think of as the Khabib positions and using them the way Khabib did. Um... Again, like not being too precious about the idea of having to cleanly complete a takedown, uh, which Khabib never was. It's about chaining them together and getting to a position where you can work and therefore advance to better positions. How was it two or three times that he got, uh, that Bilal got Thompson against the fence, uh, with like the half back mount, the single hook, leg lace, just pounding him with his left hand. While, while grabbing the cross wrist with the uh, hand behind his back. That is a Khabib position. Like, that is, that's modern MMA grappling in my mind. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I kind of, that one specifically, I think of a, that is the Kane position. It's really like, yeah, obviously there was like a lot of cross pollination going on. Sure. You know, that was, that was where he made, I think, uh, that was sort of where he made the 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 JDS fight happen. I did find myself wondering, like, how how much? Because uh, one of the things I was thinking about, you know, before the fight, is that Hamid has a couple of things which could trouble Thompson. One of them didn't come into play at all, which is the low kicks. Yeah. Um. But which, based on how well like, he was uh, defending. The strikes on the feet, probably a good idea not to lean into the low kicks too much in retrospect. He did yeah, not yeah, yeah. seem comfortable enough on the feet to, uh, I don't know. Maybe that's a result. Oh, he, did, he did get kind of, he did get kind of badly stung in the third yeah. round, right? Yeah. Or in the second. It was, there was some point was where Thompson them, yeah, yeah. got like a minute of striking exchanges and was, uh, just like lighting Bilal up. Now maybe you could argue that's a factor of the fact that he had game planned to do zero striking. And had yeah. not worked himself into a place of confidence where he, he knew and was willing to accept getting hit. But, um, as it looked, uh, on the night, yeah, it, I think the wrestling was the way to go. Sorry, you were saying. Yeah. But uh, of the two things, like, uh, they would like the low kicks, but also the foot speed, just like Bilal is, a, he's just a pretty quick guy on his feet. Mm -hmm. It made me think, like, how, much has Thompson benefited from people fighting people who are just like <clears throat> just slow. Yeah. Just slow people. They're all pretty much uh like almost everyone he's ever fought apart from Burns, uh Woodley, uh, Bilal, and uh, in some ways Till. Till isn't Till isn't Till, Till is actually quite plodding, but he does at least yeah. chase people. But you know, Pettis <laughs> can yeah, be Pettis. momentarily quick, and he knocks Thompson out. Yeah, I mean, Pettis, I think, is just a weird fight. Like, Pettis yeah. fought the most plodding performance of his career. It's true. Sort of. Uh, 
marching around the cage after after Thompson. It's hard to take, to draw anything like remotely predictive from what happened in that fight. Yeah, it, it just did. It, it did make me feel that like a good amount of uh, those like karate style <laughs> counters that that Wonder Boy draws people into like really works a lot better if he's fully confident of exactly where his opponent is going to be. Yeah. Like, if they're just a lot quicker, I think it, it genuinely gives him gives him pause on sure. his counters. Man, it is kind of that is kind of astounding. I'm just looking at the record. I'm like, how many how many of these people do I not think of as foot slow? And like Rory's kind of foot slow. Rory is very foot slow. Masvidal is kind of foot slow. Luke is definitely foot slow. Neil is kind of foot slow. He's kind of a plodding fighter. Uh, or at the very least, at his best, he kind of has the Barbosa thing. Where, like, when he is mm. moving around quickly, he's not doing anything else. Cote, certainly. Hendricks, certainly. Not Robert Whitaker. I think that still stands yeah, out as Robert maybe Whist the best Robert aged. Gross, definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The best aged performance on Thompson's entire record. Uh, but yeah, I guess yeah. that's just welterweight. <laughs> so much of slow asses and, uh, and wrestlers and Stephen Thompson. I don't know, man. I do feel like Thompson, I feel like that, um, that necessary gap has shrunk because Thompson did look slower to me. I think mm, if you, yeah, if, oh yeah, absolutely. If you jump back even to like the Luke fight pretty recently, um, this was him reacting quite slowly to things. Like there, there came a point where Bilal was just able to straight up shoot without setup in open space, and and half the time it would work. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, it was one of those ones where I was just like, "This is a crippling style matchup, uh, even for an age if he's aging." And then I looked at the actual fight, and I was like, "It's not that bad. Maybe it's just maybe this would have been." I think, you know, all honesty, I probably still would pick Stephen Thompson in his prime to beat Bilal Muhammad, but mm -hmm. I think it would be closer than I thought it would be. I think I was thinking this would, this would look like uh, the early, in, in prime Steve, Stephen Thompson would make him look like, yeah. um, like, uh, what was that early, like his early fight with like his early rounds against like Alan Joban and stuff. Uh, he's just yes. Getting, he's just getting picked off with you straight You mean Bilal Muhammad, yes. Body kicks, yeah. He's getting picked off with straight punches and body kicks. Yeah. Enforcing exchanges and then just not being, like, quick and explosive enough when he actually gets the exchanges he wants to win them routinely. Hmm. He, yeah. Um, I think the Joe Ban fight is a very good point of comparison. Larger cage, five years in the past. I would absolutely pick Stephen Thompson. Um. But over that time, again, I think this is like a Bilal Muhammad who has benefited from all of this UFC experience. He he is like one of the most consistently grinding pace pushers in this division. Um, and he has developed. He's kind of like a – he's kind of taken like the smart Mosfidal route where like his, his strength really is his well-roundedness. Huh? Uh, and he uses it more pointedly. Like a lot more pointedly. It's not like the Masvidal thing where he's not, uh, like, he can't sleep at night if he doesn't, like, out, have at least one moment where he out wrestles every opponent. <laughs> um, Muhammad will have fights where he doesn't wrestle at all. If it's not part of the game plan, if it's not the thing that he thinks will beat the opponent. And then he has fights like this where he wants absolutely nothing to do with the striking and you look at how it plays out in this real two true outcome kind of way. You can't dispute it, uh, his approach. You cannot yeah. argue with those results. I feel like you could have a, like a, a, a graph of, of, um, sickle talent versus strategic application. Mm -hmm. And it would have like, Asvidal at one end, and then, yeah, Leon Edwards, and then <clears throat> Bilal at the other. Yeah. Like he is the most like of the of the welterweight all rounders is by far the most like 
strategically and uh, strategically coherent. And he is also obviously like by far the least physically talented. Yeah. I just want to find out like on a statistical level, this has got to be not only the most takedowns, but the most control time Bilal's ever had in a fight. Huh? The most takedowns he had in a fight before this was against Jordan Meehan. A fight which I completely forgot happened. Uh, in 2017, he had four takedowns of 12 attempts and got five seconds shy of seven minutes control time. And in this fight, seven takedowns completed of nine attempts. So both a higher finish rate and a higher number of takedowns finished and three seconds shy of 12 minutes of control time. Jesus. 1157. Like this, again, I think he, it was probably the right time in Stephen Thompson's career and probably the right venue, but this is one of the best performances Ball Muhammad's ever, ever had, despite all that. He's, he is really he is really coming into his own. Damian Meyer and Stephen Thompson are obviously well past it by this point, but they are still... Many people have tried to beat them once they were past it and have still gotten humiliatingly yep. crashed. I think when Bilal turns 34... He's going to figure out that he can throw his jab against a southpaw, and he will become world champion. That's all it's he inevitable. has left to learn. It's inevitable. <clears throat> uh, yeah. He will, he will defeat uh, Kamzat Shimaev, the UFC welterweight belt, and all will be well in, well in the world. Yeah. He's also an incredibly likable man. How lucky are we? Literally the only thing Bilal uh, ever does that embarrasses... Apparently he isn't. Like, a bunch of people now on Twitter, like, saying that they don't like him. Well, that's because he's famous now, Phil. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know him personally. The only thing he's ever done to annoy me is, like, be online obsessed with Elon. He wants yeah. Elon Musk to be his, like, crypto boyfriend. That's, like, the only thing that he's ever done that I, that has rubbed me the wrong way, and he's entitled to that in my in my book. Oh, he's he's always like. You have to do a lot in my book to to um. It's MMA. <laughs> there get away from like people just being like simultaneously gritty and trying to improve, but also being like honest about their losses and stuff. Yeah, buy it buys you a lot in my book. And it's MMA. You There's a curve, awesome. right? <laughs> there yeah. has to be a curve. He seems pretty cool by by that standards of that curve. All right, let's take a break then. When we come back, we've got uh, Amanda Lamosh versus Angela Hill. Uh, we can talk about the decision in that one as well as the fight itself. thought that was a really interesting one, actually. Um, let's just not talk about Ricky Simone and Rafael Sonsal, uh, although we probably will. Uh, Mateusz Gamrot con continues to look super impressive. Cub Swanson. All kinds of shit to talk about and more after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like. And in return, you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Okay, welcome back to Heavy Hands. Um, still on the main card here of uh, UFC Fight Night, Lewis versus Dowkhouse. Let's talk about Amanda Lamos versus Angela Hill. Um, I've been reminded once again by the broadcast that it is Lamos and not Lamos, so that is how I'm going to be saying it until the next time I forget. Um, this this fight seems to exist for me, Phil, in two parallel universes at once. Because huh? I was like, all right, Angela Hill used to be a fighter who would start super hot with a pace that she could not maintain for three rounds. And the result would be she would be inexorably dragged into a 50-50 war that she basically almost never won. 
Um, and that was against like a certain level of competition, a certain level of athlete. Here we are years later in Angela Hill's career. Let's see. How many years has she been fighting? First pro fight in 2014. Um, so we're, we're in the prime of Angela Hill's career. She's 36, however, you know, physically maybe a little past her prime. Uh, but here she is going against a great athletic prospect, more than a prospect at this point, a fringe contender, and forcing her to fight at a pace that she can't really maintain and doing lots of attritive work to back that up. That's one universe. The other universe is that it was still <laughs> the classic Angela Hill fight where, she, you know, she did kind of suffer the effects of her own pace. And uh-huh. it felt like a way smarter, more uh, focused, more um, like purposefully channeled version uh, or sort of approach to the fight where Hill was clearly like the savvy fighter taking her opponent into deep waters. But she was ultimately still Angela Hill. And for that reason, I don't have an issue with the decision. Spiritually, I would have liked Angela Hill to win it. She felt like the winner, but I, you know. The way fighting is scored, I think the decision makes sense kind of the way they rendered it. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a really close one. I think yeah. the, the main thing is that I just feel. Oh, I'm not that, saying like, it's the only correct decision. I'm just saying that third yeah, round yeah. was close enough that I'm like, yeah, either one is yeah. fine. Yeah. The only thing is like, is when someone gets into these kind of decisions and they lose them every single time. Mm-hmm. So that's gotta, that's gotta be the the bummer. You, you gotta have, you gotta have earned one of them at some point, surely. Right. But, but this was uh, less I mean, of a robbery than her losing the Gadelia split decision, in my opinion. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I definitely thought uh, she won that. Some fight. of those were actual. Some of those I thought were actual robberies. This mm-hmm. was just like, oh yeah, maybe thought she won that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. It basically hinges on whether you think that. Uh, I mean, it doesn't even hinge on it, but like it's it, uh, the spinning elbow knockdown in the in the third is pretty much, um, I think the the key moment. Which which yeah, if you think that's significant, then and you probably give her the round, and if you don't, then you don't. Which you know, and then I think you could even without it, I think you could probably give her the third. But it's it's just you know, it's just a very close fight where. He landed more and Lamosh landed harder. Yeah. And also, I don't think the spinning elbow landed clean. Oh, no, it definitely didn't. Yeah. Um, She's literally, she hasn't won, Angela Hill hasn't won a split decision. She's been two, two, three, four, five, which actually feels low when you, you, you see it as such a pattern in her career. But she, the first one she ever went to is the only one she's ever won. That was against uh, Lavinia Souza in Invicta. So Jesus, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, the problem is, is that like, she's she's again. It's very difficult to find like. She, she's gone through sort of the Arlovsky thing, where she's now sort of very well rounded uh without necessarily having like being uh, being like super dangerous anywhere mm-hmm. she kept landing she still like pours her shots horrifically, which meant that she kept landing like these clean shots which weren't just weren't damaging Lamos as much as the ones coming back at her yeah just meant it means that she has to keep. Like, she has to keep battering away at people, or more commonly nowadays, it means that she just needs, like, consistent top control or clinch offense mm-hmm. to actually, like, cement rounds. Because as it stands, she just ends up, yeah, just, like, uh, pouring punches at people and then not being able to, not necessarily coming out <clears throat> of the end of the damage equation. Yep. She's had, I think it's... Um, on the one hand, there's definitely a physical ceiling for Angela Hill. We've, we've seen that. This is, there's such a clear difference in just raw speed and power in a fight like this. Um, but there's also like Angela Hill has had persistent mechanical issues. 
I don't, she's, Mm -hmm. she hasn't been an Eric Del Fierro fighter for quite a while, but uh, at least I don't think so. Is she still? I thought she might be, but I'm not actually sure. I thought she no longer was. All it says on her wiki page is the Alliance MMA. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, it's, it's, look at Dominic Cruz's punching. The, 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 the way he uses those shots, um, has certainly changed. And, and one might say improved. I think he's, he's, as we, we said a couple weeks ago, he's way more boxing centric now than he was in his, uh, like championship days. But, uh, this is what his punches look like. They're, they're winging shots that like they, they have this, this uncanny ability to somehow incorporate the entire body into the shot, but no part of the chain is moving in the right order. So like, or it's like, it's like the, the, the Winkle John overhand for, for every punch. Yep. Uh, where you're really throwing weight around, but like weight transfer isn't just weight transfer. Like you can push a big heavy object and you're transferring weight from one place to another, but that's not going to create impact. Impact needs, you know, a certain amount of acceleration and balance. It's also why I think Angela, um, struggles to throw combinations, which would have also helped her tremendously in a fight like this to be able to put together four and five shots when Lamosh was loading up so much and throwing fastballs every chance she got. Lamosh became more and more, uh, single strike happy as the fight went on, uh, more limited and Hill, but Hill is mechanically limited in, in a similar way. Um, where she just struggles yeah. to maintain her position because of how sort of violently she flings her body around when she's throwing punches. It's just, it is bad form at the end of the day and it, and, and it limits her, but it is, it seems to be a thing that kind of everyone at that gym has in common. Except Jeremy Stevens for no apparent reason. Except Jeremy Stevens. It's exactly the opposite problem. Yeah, but Jeremy Stevens is like, uh, unlike Dominic Cruz and Angela, is definitely a natural puncher. I doubt anyone really had to teach Jeremy Stevens really how to punch. Uh, very true. He, he, you know, he's probably the kind of guy you put a baseball in his hand and he would hit a target. You know, I bet he just has a feel for how to throw his hands around. It is, it is also weird that like, he's such a specific kind of puncher is in the, you know, Look at Hill and Cruz. You're you're like, oh, these people are never setting their, never really setting their feet to drive through their shots. Yeah, and it's like that is Jeremy Stevens, also <laughs> like the exact opposite of his 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 problem, where he's just gonna plod after someone and just throw a hook that has been like, yeah, rooted from eight feet under the ground. Jeremy Stevens is. It just occurred to me the Artem Lobov of Elias. <laughs> <laughs> he has been kept around so that Dominic Cruz can practice his game against him. Jeremy Stevens is the perfect, like, he, he really is like that. What Dominic Cruz does is definitely the way to beat Jeremy Stevens. It's just like that run around true. and never let him set his feet and then hit opportunistic takedowns. That's how you beat Jeremy Stevens. Um, wow. I never really put that together before. Anyway, Angela Hill is much more, you know, she's on the team. She's, she's in the Dominic Cruz mold and it, it, it has held her back through her career. I think it is also part of the reason that her, um, early paces, her, her fast starts both then and still kind of now, um, do hamper her. She's not efficient. You know, I think she could push a faster pace, throw more punches and still have more energy in round three with, uh, with a couple, corrections to her form which obviously is easier said than done because at this point those habits are really really ingrained in her muscle memory yeah but I even much, so much much more mechanically consistent but also like has terrible habit of watching her work in that too every phase yeah very counterable uh, that being said strategically really strong fight from angela hill huh? the pressure was money she did not shy away after getting hurt. Uh, I mean, if it was, if it was me, if it was a younger Angela Hill, she might have shied away from just the breeze off the first missed punch from Lamosh because it was clear immediately yep. 
how dangerous it would be to stand in the pocket with her. Uh, but that's what she needed to do. And she kept forcing it. I loved the clinches. I could have, I could have used more clinches, frankly. Mm-hmm. I thought it was, it, it was, uh, one thing that Zane and I talked about, you know, Leslie Smith destroyed Lamosh in the clinch, a much less in shape Lamosh and in, in the wrong division. Uh, and Smith herself being quite big for that, for said division, whereas the opposite is true here with Hill. Even so, we looked at that and we're like, oh, the clinch might work for Hill. It worked really well. I thought she had a clear, strong advantage there. She was able to find her underhooks in reverse position at will. It's another thing they obviously know about at Alliance MMA <laughs> is underhooks. Oh, yes. And <laughs> she was landing lots of body shots. She was getting in with the elbows. And Hill's a really crafty clinch fighter where you – She's almost got a Neil Magny thing where you, you might feel like you have some advantages against her early, but she adapts really well and will find openings and will start beating you to the punch on clinch breaks. Um, you know, be- before you reach the halfway point of the fight. And I thought that was super impressive. And yeah. And then round three, she just, she did, she was a little slower, which is a classic Angela Hill thing. She, same game plan. I feel like from the clinch, she could have, she could have. She could have broken and thrown more elbows. And, yeah, yeah. But I think, again, the fact that she didn't really have a way of getting back into the clincher, I think she was just like, yeah. no, I'm just going to hold on to it here. I think that was her problem. Uh, that she, she had to walk through the punching range of Lamosh, who caught a bit of a second wind and who was already quicker of foot and hand and um, getting to that range safely, you know. She should have, t- should have taken a cue from Bilal Muhammad, though. Just run at her, you know? <laughs> like, huh. What's the worst that can happen? Other than the worst that almost happened in round one. Okay. Um, well, I guess we have enough time, meaning two minutes, to talk about Hafez Sunsau. I think what we've learned is that Ricky Simon is simply a better... More skilled counterpuncher than TJ Dillashaw. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, but, um, Ricky Simone, you know, this is another one like Muhammad Wonderboy. You have to give some credit to Ricky Simone. It this, this fight would have not happened this way with it, with it, with a, a younger Hafe Sunsau. The man is, I think, very clearly past it at this point very past it and he is a is a 40 year old bantam yeah he's he, he been fighting is he, the... go on is he is he is he 39 he's 39 he's insanely old for a bantam he will turn 40 in july yeah 39 years old he's been fighting the best in the world for years and years and years the man made his pro debut in 2004 that's a full 10 years before Angela Hill. Um, like he was fighting, he was fighting in the WEC by like what? 2007, eight top of my head. 2009. Really? I thought he was earlier than that. Hmm, Interesting. Not according to Wikipedia, even so. And, um, yeah, but having said that, Ricky Simone, who's improving striking. We have noted for his past several performances, He's genuinely kind of good at striking now. Huh? You know, he's it, it might be kind of basic, but the man is a great athlete. He's got a huge cushion, uh, a huge margin for error because of that, and has clearly picked up not only a lot of fundamental techniques, but just concepts on the conceptual level. Uh, when he engages and strikes, he can tell when he's in danger, when he's out of position, or he's too close. And will therefore have some defense ready, uh, for the, for the counterattack. There were a couple moments he pressured, he fainted, and he was ready to duck under a, a swing, uh, when he drew it out of a Sun Tzu. He's, he's not in there doing things thoughtlessly. He's not unprepared for the consequences of striking on the feet. And when he attacks, he's doing it in layers. He went out there and threw, I think it was like a faint right hand left uppercut. That landed on a Sun Tzu and then came back and 
fainted the right uppercut and then landed the right hook. Uh, he's out there like putting hypothetical punches together. Um, he's, he's getting good. Like he, he's, he is fight. He's, he's boxing on that conceptual level that people who actually kind of have a feel for, for striking, um, fight on. I mean, like I wasn't, I was, I was only being half facetious with the, like, sure. <laughs> the counter puncher than, than Dillashaw like thing. That really, like, that last sequence isn't really the kind of thing that you would see from TJ Dillashaw in no. the pocket. TJ just sort of tends to give up at that point and just keep going for it. But it's, it was really like, it was a, it was actually a genuinely pretty finishing sequence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, he still looks, looks super janky. And the bites on everything, and he really reminded like he he really just is like highly upgraded Clay Guida, who could also like put together some pretty surprisingly uh, effective combinations back in you know, back in his prime. But like yeah, just the simple fact of like integrating head movement into his combinations, it was again, it was another one of those things where I was just like. Oh yeah, no one ever really did that against Rafael Sansanti. Yeah, they pressuring just picked and... up right hand counters on people the whole time. Exactly, because they just stood there with his head, their heads up in the air, like all those elite bantamweights that he fought throughout the years, like all of them. Whereas the Sun Sal flummoxed some people by being able to do it himself. Hmm? By just like that was the key to Sun Sal's success as being a really keyed in, defensively minded fighter who is willing to move his head or move his feet or block or whatever it takes to not get hit so he can come back and counter. And yeah, Simone is in here like using a feint to get into the range and then like pulling and then coming back with a shot or ducking under and then going right back on top of a Sun Sal. And he's, he's putting not just uh, head movement, but putting feints in the middle of his combinations, changing up his rhythm, uh, keeping the, the defensive uh, opponent occupied with his pressure. Like, yeah, it's like, it's good striking. <laughs> it's actual striking. And he looked like he looked to be hitting harder than I have seen him in the past. Oh, yes. Uh, he looked to be better grounded, more confident, um, and getting his feet into, into range with him before landing his punches. And, uh, yeah. The guy's I mean, good, man. Yeah. Everything, yeah, everything has to come with caveats. I think, I think Wonder Boy is significantly on the downslope. I think the last two fights indicate that yeah. Falas and Sal is shot, shot. Yeah. Like, like, don't pick him against most of the bantamweight division kind of no. shot. No. No. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a. It was. It was a very. It's a. It was a great performance from someone who's like, who was already a troubling troubling matchup for a lot of the division just because he's insanely tough and has incredible work rate and muscles really hard. Mm -hmm. So there's that. I suppose uh, we take one more break, come back. We've got a couple more fights from this card to talk about, and then that'll be our last um, UFC card recap of the year. After this. Ow. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. And welcome back to Heavy Hands. Just a couple more fights to get through here. Um, let's talk about... Oh, wait. Was there one before Mateusz Gamrot? No, no. He's next. Mateusz Gamrot took on Carlos Diego Fajera. Um... Speaking of guys who uh, push a relentless pace and wrestle super hard, Mateusz Gamrot. I like this guy. 
I enjoy watching his performances. I, uh, I was sort of wondering coming into this fight with Carlos Diego Fajeda, how, uh, how, first of all, I had some questions about how Carlos Diego Fajeda, I guess it's just Diego Fajeda. It's much easier. How Diego would, um, would respond to the grappling, you would assume. I mean, it was sort of a, a, a split between his previous two performances where, um, against Gregor Gillespie, he looked really, really prepared to counter grapple and counter wrestle. Um, that was his entire mindset. And he like didn't accept any bottom position. And he did that so fervently that he broke his cardio until he really had no choice but to accept bottom position. Um, but it was a real head-to-head defense versus offense kind of grappling battle. Against Benil Dariush, from the beginning, he looked a little more willing to actually engage in protracted grappling battles. I was curious in this one, A, would he be prepared in the same way he was for Gillespie, which he largely was, um, instantly creating scrambles and elevating and not accepting positions whenever Gamrat took him down. And then I was wondering, um, okay, well, can he do that without getting tired? And uh didn't really even get to the point where it mattered. I don't know if he looked like he was getting notably tired by the time Gamrot won. It was just sort of... Oh, I think it was... uh If anything, I think Gamrot was, was kind of... a weird thing that happened. Yeah, if anything, Gamrot was, 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 I think, feeling his own pace a little bit. I don't think that's necessarily a problem yeah. for him because... This is what he does. He's a guy who will shoot over a dozen takedowns and not be bothered if he can't secure control. That's just uh, part of his fighting style. And he's obviously got great conditioning. But yeah, I thought Carlos Diego Fajeda looked all right. He looked a little less old than uh, I yeah. kind of thought yeah, he did. Yeah, I mean, he was, uh, yeah, I thought he was actually surviving that second round much better than I thought he would, given the insane pace of the first. Yeah. Like, given this, the and the Gillespie fights. I was just like, oh, he's going to be really losing it, and he's going to start losing it in this round, because this was faster paced than even they were. Yeah. Um, but he looked okay, and then, yeah, his, his rib gave out, or whatever it was, and that was the end of it. Yeah, and, and that was, like, it was a shame. It's not like a, a fluke or anything. I, I, you know, as most people did, like, gave Gamrot round one, and round two was competitive enough that like the fact that Gamrot still had good position on uh, when it when it ended. It was just a shame because it was the it was the best fight on the card on paper and it was the best fight on card the card pretty much. Just like in, in actuality. Like it was it was just a great fight for the eight or so minutes we got of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I like Mateusz Gamrat a lot. I thought his, um, he actually looked to be slightly more competent with his striking, more, more confident, mm, I should say. Yes, definitely. Than I've seen in the past. Um, like every MMA fighter on earth, except for like th- three of them. I, I don't, I don't think he's much to, much to write home about defensively as a striker. Um, but he understands distance enough to keep his opponent at bay, uh, and he's got the incredibly good reactive takedowns, which make a lot of people reluctant to run after him. So that, that kind of serves for defense. Offensively, I thought he looked a lot more layered. Um, a lot more layered than he has in previous performances where, where he really has been like, um, just sort of looking for single strikes. Uh, again, a little Winkle John esque, just sort of mixing things up for the sake of mixing them up. In here, he was connecting combinations with feints. He was drawing reactions out of the opponent and, uh, and, and coming up with, yeah, again, layered ways of, of, of countering them. And a lot more of his single strikes were just jabs. And hey, that's the one to do if you're going to be doing single strikes. That's the safe one. That's the quick one. It's the one that's already close to the opponent. Um, it's the one that, that everything else builds on. And, uh, yeah, I really liked that look from, from Gamrot. And, you know, if he's willing to take down and grapple, uh, Carl that Diego too. Pereira, it's a, go on, please. A, 
it's like a good sign for his his career running through the division because there's it means he can he's going to be able to and willing to like take down and wrestle with pretty much everyone. Yes, I, would, I want to see him grapple with people. I don't. I'm glad to see him improving in his striking. I would like to see him, you know, continue to be a offensive grappler because he's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, that too. You know, I, I can I can respect Bilal Muhammad for just completely saying fuck the striking while also saying there are so many times when I would just like to see somebody actually use their A game. <laughs> I think for Bilal it's okay because there is no A game. You know, the A game is whatever's needed for the fight. A guy like Gamrot, those, those takedowns, the scrambling, uh, the scrambly grappling, that's a big part of his A game. That, that is his A game. And I, and it always bothers me when fighters like that will eschew their specialty because like, oh, the opponent is good at this too. It's like, perfect. That means you're going to break them when you're better at it than them. Prove you're you're the best. Are you the best in the world? That is often, I think, a really good mindset is like, for genuinely, for fighters to have is like, oh, the opponent's specialty is my specialty. In MMA among grapplers, we so often see the the, the K1 jiu-jitsu battle when I would like to see people like Kamar Usman and Colby Covington. Why the fuck do you guys Mm -hmm. wrestle? You know, neither of you has something to prove. I don't know. So yeah, that's good. I, I appreciate it. We actually got the wrestling that I, th- I thought we would get. You know, it, it's it's rare enough that I feel fulfilled when it happens. That's the police. Excuse me. I mean to get you for trying to encourage more lay and pray in the UFC. <laughs> Um, all right, quick hits, just to, just to wrap us up here. We don't really have time to discuss these things in depth, but there were quite a few, again, other entertaining fights. Cub Swanson, Darren Elkins, worst beating of Darren Elkins' career. I, I can only take consolation from the fact that it was Cub Swanson who dished it out. I mean, not the worst of his career, but the worst in a while. Where it was just a yeah, straight I mean, up ass again, he didn't have any moments. Go on. Again, it's like, this is definitely a, Feels like a getting ready for the glue factory kind of performance. Oh, I mean, yeah. but I think that this one would always be like really problematic for Elkins. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he's, he's he's super loopy. He's also incredibly a- he's sort of very accurate with his big loopy punches, and he's because he's like a big loopy puncher just not going to get shocked by anything that Darren Elkins does. It's just going to be like because Elkins often like surprise people with like a- aggressive weird combos. Yeah. He would just extend and, the exchange with these awkward ropes. Yeah. It's, that's just like kind of what Cub does. That's his that, that is his A game. Plus uh, actual boxing fundamentals. This is what yes. Zane and I talked about. Cub is like this is the the beautiful destruction ethos that Cub Swanson perfectly straddles the two worlds of like MMA and boxing, where he's got a jab and he can feint and he can build combinations, he can use defense and counter all these great things that boxers do, which makes sense because you know his coach. I'm not sure if he still works with um, Joel Diaz, but his you know coach was a boxing coach, one of them. And he spars with a lot of boxers. And on the other hand, he's like classic MMA striker where it's like he'll go southpaw. You're like, Oh, he's going to do a big left kick. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or, you know, he has somebody against the fence and like his first thought is wheel kick or he'll throw single insane looping full power punches. He's a wonderful marriage of the two worlds. And, uh, yeah, he doesn't get thrown by weird loopy striking like Darren Elkins, nor is Darren Elkins enough of a singular threat with any give and take down attempt to turn okay. Cub into the guy who froze up against Frankie Edgar? It's just like, ah, eh, I can go in there and exchange with him. And, um, oh, by the way, just, uh, since we, I talked so much about the sort of implications, uh, the threat of the jab last week with, uh, Cody Garbrandt and how he was taking that threat away and, 
it's it's such an important part of your preemptive defense to have that jab threat in the opponent's mind. Um, when Cub is on, when he's in boxing mode, like say the first two rounds of his fight with Jeremy Stevens or this fight, um, watch him to see how he uses his jab. Because that fucked Darren Elkins up, I think, more than anything else. Uh, before all the, the crazy, the South ball, like shifting off to an angle, um, before the, any of the wild kicks, it was Elkins thinking, I want to pressure and get in this guy's face and just not being able to because Cub Swanson's jab was ready and he just smashed it into his fucking nose every time he moved forward. And that's what a jab does. So study Cub people. Not Martin Campman or whoever. Cub holds his hand by his, his hands by his goddamn pockets. <laughs> and, uh, and yet at least at moments, he's one of the best boxers in the sport. Yeah. Uh, okay. Anything else? Gerald Mearshart, classic comeback. <laughs> yeah. Classic. In even, like, even by Gerald Mearshart standards, this was, uh, yeah, normally it's like he has a terrible first round and then he has, just really starts to get back into it in the in the second. Uh huh. And that wasn't what happened in this one. No. Like he was this was just like a this was closer to Paul Craig. Yes. It was just a Paul like, Craig oh, fight. it's all it's all over. And suddenly you're like, oh my god, it is. Yeah. And and, you know, at the same time, made me impressed with Dustin Stoltzfus whom I have never yeah. really been particularly enamored of before. Yeah, I mean, again, he just went after a uh, super dangerous grappler and was, like, he was broadly winning. Yeah, I mean, this will show you why people don't take our stupid fucking advice, right? <laughs> to just yeah. to go out there and, and, and confidently swagger into the opponent's A-game as if you can't lose. It, it really does work um, until it really doesn't. So, you know, great finishing sequence from Gerald Mearshart. Um, mm-hmm. if you haven't seen it, I would go check out Ben Cohn's Twitter. He posted a really good video. Um, just a quick little thing, just sort of breaking down, uh, a couple of the particulars. Um, I think he talked about that reverse hook that, uh, you see a lot of the best back takers use. Mearshart certainly does where he will, he'll, he'll put both the boots in and then take one out and, uh, sort of like butterfly hook behind the thigh just to control the position. Also how willing Mearshart is to say, you know, the best grapplers don't cling to positions. When you see someone who really clings to a position, that is a window for their opponent to manipulate them because all their energy is going in one direction and you can misdirect them. You can throw them around. You can sweep them. Mearshart's a guy who will get on your back and take a hook out so that he can put that foot on the ground and readjust his position. It's all about floating. Even when the opponent isn't moving, and, um, yeah, Ben Cohn at Agent Ben 10, he did a really good video, which Mearshart himself replied to and said, it, it, not a lot of people notice these things, which was pretty cool. Um, cool. last thing I want to talk about, um, Charles Rodin, Andre Ewell. It was cool. It made me feel sorry for Andre Ewell. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, Jordan is is incredibly fun to watch offensively when he gets in his flow. Mm-hmm. Um, just like yeah, attacks all levels, uh, just consistent high pace. Probably never gonna make it as a contender, but yeah, like action fighter. Guaranteed every time, always going to go for it. He's a super fun action fighter, and it's he's like um, I don't know if you ever see like a like a dumb low budget horror movie or action movie, and you're just surprised that there is like even one kernel of depth to it. <laughs> uh-huh. That's Shredan. You're like he he is a brawler. Um, in fact, this was his least brawly performance. He he looked really well prepared for you all. Um, and was like. 
totally invested in doing a trite of damage the entire time. He worked the leg as brilliantly. He worked the body at every opportunity. Um, you know, I don't know if that was from tape because you will does have a habit of fading down the stretch or if that was just Jordan getting better. Um, but typically like he is a brawler who will surprise you from time to time with craft where, or, or the ability to adapt to what the opponent is doing. He's, he's actually comfortable enough in an insane firefight to make decisions and change as the fight goes on. And this is one where he did, he did genuinely seem to harness that earlier. Like even if the, you will had enough moments in the first round, I think you could give it to him. I thought Jordan looked, he was on the path to the win he eventually yeah. got from the start. I, I thought he won. I thought he won the first round. I, well. I gave it to him as well. Uh, I'm sure Dan. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of it is that you will was clearly fighting with himself. You know, as corner was pointing out, he's, he's such a one and done fighter. Yeah. He just wants to land a big shot, have the opponent be shocked by it and then go back and sit on the end of his reach. Mm hmm. And the problem is that, like, you will, uh, sorry, Jordan's, Jordan just throws up the double forearms. And, yeah. If he thinks you're done, he'll come back at you and he will come back with a combination. And just the simple maths of that just started to drown you all over time. And you could see the, uh, against Erosa, Jordan's tendency to just, you know, until the opponent's done behind the double forearms and then come back and get him. But I'm into huge trouble because Erosa was himself extremely diverse and also recognized that, like, this is my turn to be aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, Ewell just couldn't shake it. He couldn't make himself, like, just go after Jordan when, when Jordan... Because every time, every time the ending of him having the the double forearms up was Jordan charging him. Yeah. Couldn't, what you will, what, um, what Erosa did was he had Jordan backpedaling by the time. Yeah. He finished his combinations. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, like the ability when to he's fight in his, in layers, you know, which Jordan can do with surprising skill, especially when he's pressuring. But, um, like as a, like he he throws incredibly pretty offensive combinations. Yeah, absolutely. His low kick setups. I mean, shit. He was looking like a goddamn tie fighter out there. He was he he was actually finding some really really interesting ways after combinations, after feints, sometimes just straight up raw. Uh, sometimes as a first layer counter, like a same time counter. He had a million different ways of kicking the legs. Um, and yeah, I, I totally agree. You will also has a problem. Uh, it's not just that he's one and done. It's like he, he, he fights in such a way that he has to be one and done because he throws way too hard mm. with everything. Like you will has such reach, um, that if he forgot about power altogether, if you could somehow convince Andre, you will, he will never knock out another opponent, which at this point he's getting kind of old. Division change hasn't worked yet. That might be the case. Who knows? But if you could convince him of that and just tell him just touch, 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 he, he could land so many free jabs and fuck up the rhythm of so many of his opponents because he can literally just touch them from super far away. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you put it in his head that he's holding a spear and when you're holding a spear, you poke, poke, poke because it's sharp and you don't have to do a ton of damage. And it, and that's how it works. But he thinks he's artillery. And like, he, he thinks he's further away than he is. And that he has to send, you know, a 50 pound shell with every single attempt he makes. He has that thing you always talk about, that risk calculation where he's clearly so uncomfortable with the idea of having to exchange that he, he puts way too much into the shots he brings into those exchanges. And ends up making it a certainty that he's going to have to exchange. Whereas, yeah, he, he should just be touching and maintaining his distance. But, uh, it's, it's probably too late at this point. Anyway. Unfortunately, great, so. Yeah. Great showing for Jordan. Um, it ended up looking like a tailor made opponent for him, 
but um I thought he did a he did a pretty good job with that. And that's all that I have to say. Anything else? Uh nothing from my end. Pen and Chase was fun. Another fight well, where... surprisingly so. I, I remember the last time... Uh, who was the last person that Pennington got that um, front choke on? I, I remember she did that back in... Uh, back, like, years ago. Apparently she so, got a... Yeah, uh, it's listed as a guillotine on... Tanya Evinger on Tough. She got another guillotine against Raquel Pa'aluhi. But that was a Destiny MMA. I doubt any of us have seen that. And then she she got, of course, the famous bulldog choke against Ashley Evans Smith. Oh, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, but she does have a good front headlock game. Yeah. And um, she also got there with a lot of good body work. It's a con- it's a continually emergent theme in 2021. I think we may have to make mention of that somehow in the handies. It has kind of been the year of body work. Really has, hasn't it? Yeah. We have seen a lot of fights and even whole cards seem to be sort of defined by opponents wearing their, uh, or by fighters wearing their opponents down by punching them in the body, which go figure works really fucking well. So, um, on that note, we're about to wrap up. Mentioning the handies, uh, reminds me to tell all of you listeners again to hit us up at the hashtag that we definitely planned in advance. Hashtag handies. 2021. That's H-A-N-D-I-E-S. Uh, if you have award category suggestions, if you have fighter nominees suggestions, um, if you want to say, what is this? Is, what are the categories? Who are you? Is this an OnlyFans thing? If you have any of those questions, send them to us on Twitter with the hashtag handies2021 and uh we may not respond to many of them but we will try to incorporate as many of them as we can into the coming year end awards um which I'm very excited for we have hotter competition for worst brain thinking i think uh than we, we could have supposed after yeah Piotr Jan's famous uh brain diarrhea against Aljamain Sterling so yeah, that's a that's a competitive category right there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I do every year. I hope you guys are looking forward to it too. And um, until then, if you want to send that hashtag to us directly, you can use the handles at Evil Greg Jackson. That's Phil at Boxing Bush. That's me. Uh, check out our Patreon as well. Three dollars a month, all the content. A lot of you guys have signed up this year, and it has been lovely and wonderful to see. And um, we did last week post um, more undercard discussion with Schwan Humes, who I think a lot of you enjoyed as a guest, and we were delighted to have him on as well. So anyway, coming up soon, the Handies, hashtag Handies 2021. Until next week, if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. So... Do we have to record the depressed us as well tomorrow? I think so. Call it that. But I... What's that? <laughs> Fuck all of that. <laughs> okay. You, you, you too accurately did the sort of fading away. The fading away. away. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't really hear it.